Hello everyone and welcome to cloudnative.tv. This is the Search Magic Show with Siam and uh, today is a very exciting day. Before we start, uh, let me read out the uh, CNCF code of conduct. So this is an official uh, live stream of CNCF as such subject to CNCF code of conduct. Please do not add anything to the chat or questions that would be in the violation of the code of conduct. Basically, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. So this is streaming live on Twitch, uh, Cloud Native TV, and make sure you hit that follow button and make sure you make the stream interactive. Uh, so Cert's Magic Show is obviously all about certifications. And in the last stream, I discussed about the importance of certifications, what Kubernetes certifications exist, and uh, where we are with respect to uh, the certifications, how many are there, what is the course curriculum, and how things work during the exam. So all these things were discussed in the previous one. I have posted the YouTube link for that if anybody wants to check that out. And uh, in today's uh, session, uh, I'm joined by Tim, who is an official instructor at Linux Foundation. And welcome, Tim, to the show. Please introduce yourself to the community. Uh, hi there. Thanks Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, as mentioned, my name's Tim, uh, Tim Serwitz. I'm actually the training program director for the Linux Foundation. And I, I'm also the author of the three classes we offer uh, of instructor-led training courses in Kubernetes that would line up with the CKA, the CKAD, and the CKS uh, exams. Awesome. So glad to have you, Tim. And this will be a really exciting stream because we have tons of uh, learning. So basically, if, uh, if you have ever thought of, you know, uh, starting with your CKA journey and, uh, you know, uh, learning about that, then probably this episode would be the best one to start with because we are actually starting kind of from scratch and we'll be discussing uh, what Kubernetes is, its architecture, components, uh, what are what's the YAML components, what was the namespace and all that. And we also have uh, labs that we'll do live. So live labs will be done so that uh, to show you how things are set up actually. And uh, obviously it, it is one-to-one -one mapping with the certification exam because uh, you need to have an environment obviously to, for the practice, you can do that. And also uh, they, there can be scenarios related to that uh, on, on the similar uh, you know concepts. So today's curriculum uh, that, that we are targeting is the uh, cluster architecture and installation and the configuration. Not touching much on the configuration, but this is the this is the uh, from the curriculum. This is what we are uh, targeting to achieve from this particular uh, episode. So yeah, without wasting any time, we'll get started. Uh, just make sure to follow that um, uh, Cloud Native TV. Yes, one last point is uh, there are two giveaways, 50% uh, discount coupons that I'll be doing at the end. So whosoever is most interactive in the chat, asking a lot of questions, uh, making it interactive would uh, get those two coupons. So with that, uh, maybe uh, Tim, we can we can start with like uh, what Kubernetes is, Kubernetes introduction. Sure, sure. Um, well, I'll, I'll, yeah, happily. Thanks very much. Um, so starting off, um, before I start sharing my screen, uh, one of the things I always like to cover is what is it that Kubernetes solves that previous ways of doing things didn't? And and this is this is probably the biggest takeaway. If you don't get much else, it's that Kubernetes is not just another VM management tool. Uh, and I want to say that before I share anything, because I want to make sure everybody kind of gets that. This is the biggest hurdle. People assume that this is just, oh, it's another flavor. I, I use this other, I used OpenStack, I used VMware. This is another VM tool. The architecture itself is different. As the architecture is different, 
It also means that our applications need to be different. So part of being a admin for a cluster, of course, is the care and feeding, the installation, the various things that go into it. But it's also feeding back to the other people in your organization, the, the developers, the other folks you might be interacting with. So they also understand that this is not just a another VM management tool. It's it's distinct, which is, I think, why talking about architecture is probably, you know, that perhaps it's it's just me, but I, I think this might be part of the the heaviest lift, the, the most difficult stuff to get, but also the most important. So with that, now that I, I've kind of hopefully impressed it upon you, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, and uh, share screen button and uh, application window. Oh, it shows up both screens. Okay, well, let me try that a different way. So let me share this PDF with you guys for now, and we'll share the other one. So uh, hopefully you are seeing it. Am I, am I indeed? You are, good, okay, good deal. So uh, this is a, a page from our uh, course, the Kubernetes admin course, uh, LFS 458. Uh, and it's, it's basically the first chapter, and it's one of the things that we get into. Uh, and the Kubernetes, is orchestration software. So when, when push comes to shove, why do we care about it? Well, it orchestrates. Think of orchestra. Everybody's playing the same music at the same time. Well, the Kubernetes is an orchestration tool for containers. So that what that does for us, what we're looking at here with this graphic is on the left, we have our control plane. On the right, we have a worker. And those are some of the, the terms that uh, we use. We're moving towards inclusive naming. So be aware that in some of the commands, you might see it called other stuff. So some of the commands inside of Kubernetes still use the previous name, but we're moving to control plane, which I'm gonna use shorthand of CP, just kind of easier to say. And then a series of workers who might also be called minions in some documentation you run across. So the the nice thing is, is that Kubernetes itself follows the same paradigm. It, it's a decoupled, transient, microservice-based uh, tool. And that's what we want to deploy. Not We're moving from VMs to containers. And it's not just, well, I'll containerize my VM. We also want it to be decoupled, meaning that it, it's not reliant on somebody else. It's transient in that the various components will be killed on a regular basis. And this is usually the biggest stumbling point. When you're like, yes, I'm going to kill this container today three times, and I'm gonna move it to a different node. If you were to go to a, a legacy DBA and say, I'm gonna terminate your database three times today, they, they probably would have an issue with it. You'd, you'd have, uh, you'd have some, some long conversations about that. But this is what I'm, I'm trying to get to, is that the whole nature of this setup is about going away from a VM management into a different architecture. So traditionally, we had with legacy uh, environments, we had legacy apps that were monolithic and then finely tuned for the equipment we had. So whatever, you know, you had a, an eight uh, processor box and 32 gig of memory. Well, you know, chances are the load would eventually get to the point that you had to do some tuning and tweaking and optimization. That makes sense, but at some point you'd have to keep buying bigger and bigger boxes uh, or you have to do more and more tuning and that makes it very unique to that equipment. And if you want to grow to a bit larger system, you have to start this process over again. So many years ago, when containers were first really becoming a thing, uh, the people at Google started a project called Borg. And Kubernetes has actually been around for, well, uh, almost 20 years now, but the first 15 of it were as this in, internal, somewhat secret project called Borg. Google used it to run their business around the world. Instead of going towards mainframes, which a lot of other big companies had done, they were saying, well, we can't, we'd have to keep buying bigger and more expensive boxes. So they went the other direction. Now we're going to go with commodity systems, which is, I think, a polite way of saying modestly priced or low end, where you're not investing in bigger and bigger servers with fancier center planes and, and more needs for, for high speed buses and complexity and ongoing cost. Now we're talking customer replaceable units that I've rack units that I can swap out. So what we want is our application, whatever that application is, to run across lots and lots of systems that each one of them doesn't necessarily have to be important. And that's what Borg was really about doing. So if you've ever used a Google product, Gmail and G, uh, Maps maybe, anywhere in the world, you were probably leveraging Borg at some point. 
So when when they gave it away, they gave away, of course, not everything, just the, the core of it. And that's what became Kubernetes, which is pilot uh, in Greek. Technically, it's the, the oarsman, the person holding the wooden oar in the, in the water. But we call it pilot or helmsman, the person steering the boat. It's orchestration software. And the purpose behind this orchestration software is to have an application running across lots and lots of nodes. So we don't want big nodes. We want lots and lots of commodity nodes. We aggregate then all the processors and all the memory together to say, oh, well, my computing environment is capable of having this app with this, you know, 512 different processors working on it. How we get there is by running our containers, which are microservices. So we're not looking for large monolithic apps. We want to divide that up into various tasks and then run that to different places. So we would have, instead of a monolithic app that might do everything, OK, this is the front end. And it accepts a, uh, an API call. And then I have a separate authentication uh, microservice someplace else. And then I have a, a, a database. And I have something else. But you divide it up by the tasks. And there really isn't a definition of how small a microservice should be, but we want to make sure it's scalable and durable. And that's where the decoupling comes in. So we want a transient, meaning I'm willing to go away and be regenerated, or whoever I was speaking to, I'll wait for them to come back. We want to write that into our code. And then the orchestration software that we're running, which is Kubernetes, handles that. It says, well, I will take care of it if you are, if you go away, I'll, I'll give you a new one. And so that's where we're going. That's the high level view of why we care about Kubernetes, what it does for us, and why it's not just another VM management tool. If we kind of get that understanding that we're going away from monolithic apps into decoupled transient microservices and why, then as we talk about the components that do it, hopefully it will make more sense. So uh, on the left hand side here, we see our control plane and the most of the stuff that we see in this graphic are actually containers themselves. There's one exception to that, and that's this container called Kubelet, which we'll talk about in a sec. But let's follow a call from the outside world through the process of perhaps making a pod. And we'll define and, and talk about the components along the way. So on the left-hand side, we see that there is a kubectl command, or kubectl. There's a ongoing uh, email about what's the proper way of calling that tool. So uh, let's let's call it kubectl for now. What kubectl actually does for you is among you know many things, not just one thing, but the kind of the, the main component is a curl. It's a curl request with some sort of HTTP verb, uh, get, post, delete, and so forth. As a result, it's an API call. So we're making a curl request, which you can do either you through kubectl, or you could generate your own curl command if you know what the certs are. And you send it to the kube API server. As kind of a self-documenting name there, the kube API server handles your API calls. And you'll notice when looking at the various arrows, all of the API calls, everybody talks to the API server. The API server handles APIs in keeping with a decoupled transient microservice concept, all it does is handle the API. So it's, it's not actually handling and managing what the API call wants to do. It's really just arranging and does three things. First, are it's authentication. Are you really who you say you are? That's done by default through a uh, token of X509 token, but you could also point yourself at a single sign-in you know, and through a webhook request. The second thing it does is authorization. Whatever the curl request was, are you authorized to do that? We do that using RBAC, role-based access control. So if you are, uh, you know, if, if you are really who you say you are, and you're authorized to create or delete or look at whatever that component is, then the third phase of what the Cube API server does is called an admission control or admission controllers because there's more than one. This is where it actually handles the API call. In this case, let us say that I asked for the creation of something called a deployment, so that which is a, a default operator that we would use. So I send a curl request to the API server saying, please create a deployment for me. The API server, then assuming that my token is proper, and then that RBAC says in this namespace, you are allowed to do that. 
then will communicate with all of these other pods. Each one of them has its own particular purpose. It's microservice. So etcd, you'll notice the only agent talking to etcd is the API server. The etcd keeps track of the persistent state of your cluster. It's not a database for end user usage. This is just for what's going on with your cluster. And, and that information can be divided into two parts. The spec, which is what it should be, and the status, which is what it is. Now, I'm oversimplifying it to some extent, but that's what etcd is keeping track of. Does it in a, in a JSON format? And so what should be and what's the current situation? And it persists there. It's also kept in memory of the cube API server container. That's and it checks the cache. And if it needs to, it'll write there uh, or, or reference the information. So only the API server talks to etcd. And so when I make a request, I would like to create a new deployment, it will communicate. If it doesn't already have it in, in its own memory, you know, does this token match? Is the RBAC setting appropriate? And then that the spec needs to change. There needs to be a deployment. Now, it, that's kind of where its job for now ends. The cube controller manager, that's at the, the top part of the control plane, that's, that's our brain. That, uh, that container has all of our operators in it. And that's a key phrase for understanding Kubernetes is operator. Sometimes you'll see them called controllers. Sometimes people will reference them as a watch loop. Uh, the, the more modern term for it is operator. It operates on something. We, the entire nature of this orchestration system is decoupled and transient. It's an understanding that whatever I was talking with is going to go away. How we do that is through a series of operators that are constantly asking for the spec, what should be, and then the current status. If they match, it just asks again over and over and over again all the time. It, that's all it does. What's the spec? What's the status? What? Over and over. If the spec and the status don't match, that's where the operation part comes in. So in this case, when I made a request for an operator, uh, sorry, for a deployment, then a moment later, the cube controller manager would make a request saying, has the spec changed? Yes, it has. There is supposed to be a new deployment called, let's call it test. Oh, okay. So it gets the, the spec has now changed. There should be a deployment called spec or a test. Moment later, it says, what's the status? Is there a deployment called test? No, there's not. Oh, I have something to operate on. So the deployment operator running inside of the cube controller manager says there's a difference and I will operate upon it. Create this deployment. Now, then it goes back and forth. There's a lot of back and forth between the brain, which is your cube controller manager, and your cube API server. The uh, deployment operator actually manages a different operator called a replica set. So this is another part of understanding the architecture of Kubernetes, that you might have these watch loops watching other watch loops, which watch resources for you. So instead of having one operator, a watch loop that does everything, we have a decoupled operator. So you do your task and I'll do mine and we can be focused, we can be updated independently, we can do what we can optimal in our job and be developed separately, which is the same concept of the entire cluster and what we want our applications to do as well. So the deployment operator says, well, do I have a replica set? Same thing goes with the API server. What's my spec there? Do I have this replica set? Well, you just created one and the status is, no, it doesn't exist. So a different operator is formed called a replica set. The job of a replica set is keeping track of replicas. Well, that operator makes a request. How many replica pods do I have that are using this pod spec? So they are replicas, meaning they use the same specification file. They're running the same image. They're using the same components. Uh, and how many of them do I have? So if I haven't told it otherwise, the replica count would be one. So the replica set says my spec says I should have a pod, one pod. How many do I have? It does this request by a label. So the architecture is based off of some sort of operator that uses a selector that ties to labels. That's all that ties everything together. Yeah, you know, there, of course, there's names and other components, but when it really comes down to it, 
each of these operators doesn't really know what components it should be keeping track of. Not from one call to the next. There isn't a session concept. It's what's the spec and what's the status and how does it know which I'm talking about? That I have a selector that matches a label. So in this case, the cube controller manager replica set operator says, how many match this particular label? You know, test, app is test. None, I haven't, I don't have, you have zero. Okay, I will operate on that information. And so back and forth, all of this is happening between the cube controller manager and your API server. All of that logic, all of that comparison is happening just there. We haven't even gone to our workers yet. I need to create a pod. So a pod spec is sent to the cube API server saying there should be a pod running this image with what of with other default parameters that the operator has sent. The pod spec goes to the API server. And of course, what does it do? Authentication, authorization, and admission control. Now I have a pod spec. I need to send that somewhere to, uh, to run. And then who do I ask? Cube scheduler. Cube scheduler, that's the next uh, pod running on that uh, CP node. Its job, again, singular job. It's a microservice. What does it do? It schedules stuff. It is getting information about the available nodes and their condition. You know, what size are they? Maybe in schedule is very flexible. You can have multiple schedulers. So there's a wide range of flexibility here. Is there a taint or a toleration I should be aware of? It's looking at all of this information. But what really comes back from Cube Scheduler to the API server is just use this node, use node two. So it does all of the logic as far as what's optimal according to the algorithm of the scheduler. Predicate, there's one part of it where it takes away nodes from the possible list, and then priorities of the remaining nodes that are still in my list, which one is best? The scheduler returns to the API server and says, I choose worker number two, whatever the case may be. At that point, the Cube API server will, again, doesn't really do anything but handle those API calls. So it will persist some of that information to etcd, saying it's supposed to be running on worker two. And then to kubelet, so let's go with that middle worker will be worker two. Um, it sends it to kubelet. Kubelet, which runs on every node, is what actually starts your containers. Doesn't do it directly. Kubelet is a systemd service. So it's the one thing here that's not a pod. It's what starts all the pods. So kubelet gets the pod spec. It's kubelet's job to talk to your container engine, whatever that container engine may be. And that's just it. We don't, the cluster doesn't really care what the actual engine is. So it could be Docker, it could be Cryo, ContainerD, FrockD, YachtD, lots of options out there. And we don't orchestrate and insist on any one of them. As long as Kubelet on that particular node knows how to talk to the engine and tell it what to do, then, then it's happy. We're all happy. So in this case, the pod spec is sent to Kubelet, which is a systemd service, accepts the pod spec, and it goes through a process of, do I have everything in this pod spec? Now, at the same time that it's doing that, do I have everything in this pod spec? a message is sent from the API server to every cube proxy, not just the one, but every single one of them. And that's an important thing to understand is that yes, only one worker in this case with, with a replica count of one, only one worker is getting the pod spec, but when the kubelet is handling the container, it's, it's uh, a microservice. So we have cube proxy that's handling the network side of things. So if there is anything having to do with the network being configured, that actually happens on all nodes, which is why you can talk to any worker, any node really, and still get to the pod, even if it's not where the pod lives. So we have that flexibility. Everybody gets these rules. We have a network plugin running that helps that communication as well. So one kubelet gets the pod spec, all of the proxies would get any necessary information and, and arrange your IP tables for that layer of communication. So going back to Kubelet, accepts the pod spec and it, it says, well, what do I need? If there's a volume that is listed, Kubelet is who talks to the kernel to get that volume mounted. And this can be important when we start talking about access to our volumes. It's important to understand the container does not do the mounting. It's kubelet that does it. And that happens before the container is even started. 
So it mounts it, talking to the local kernel, and then makes a symbolic link available to wherever the container will end up being. If you have these things called secrets or config maps, this is another part of the decoupling of our environment. We want to have the smallest image possible with any kind of uh, parameter or value or file that might change. We want that to be decoupled and separate. So we can do that in a way called a secret, which would be encoded or encrypted, or neither encoded nor encrypted, but more flexible would be a config map. So it's the kubelet's job to request all of this information. So mount the resources, download any secrets, uh, work with any of this. When it has the resources that were in the pod spec, whatever that may or may not be, when it has everything, then the pod leaves its pending state and Kubelet tells Docker, go ahead and start these containers. One of the things that happens is there's actually a pause container started first. That holds the IP address. So your pod, your, your containers do not even know what their IP will be. It's an ephemeral IP and they don't know what it is until they're started. We don't have a inside of the pod networking. So some people who are used to Docker kind of assume there must be another layer going on. Whether you're using Docker or Cryo, it's assigned and you have one IP per pod. This is probably a good time to talk, what's this pod that you keep talking about, Tim? Well, what we actually orchestrate in our environment are pods. A pod is one or more containers that have a single IP address, they share a network namespace, and they have equal potential access to storage. That's what we actually orchestrate by, pods via the pod spec. The running of the container is not something that Kubernetes actually pays attention to. It just talks to the engine, which should do that for you, which could be Docker or Cryo, Containerd, and so forth. Uh, Docker was the default. If you use kubeadm, uh, it would still be the most typical and probably easiest way to do it. But be aware that now that Docker is a, a kind of uh, got pulled in to Mirantis, really isn't Docker anymore, that the community is definitely moving towards other options. Containerd or Cryo, uh, you know, Red Hat uses Cryo already. So there's a lot of, of uh, people using it in that sense. Containerd is pretty straightforward to use and you can do other stuff. So the engine decision from a cluster admin perspective might be something that you want to sit down and, and have conversations about. When it comes down to it, as far as Kubernetes is concerned, it's compliant engine, runs a compliant image. I don't really care. Nobody would know. And that's just it. Nobody would know what the engine is if you're running a compliant engine. So, hey, this my life is much easier than. I might want to have a feature that this or that engine does for me. For example, uh, Containerd allows me to run Gvisor very easily. It's easy to get it up and running. Gvisor gives me some security. So that might be a reason to go with Containerd. Uh, Cryo is something that's used in, in Red Hat. So there's a, a large install base. It's, it's well known, well understood in that, in that realm. So you have choices, but when it comes down to it, a compliant engine runs a compliant image and nobody knows the difference. It just runs. So Kubelet's responsible on whatever that worker is. And your worker, by the way, could even be a Windows server because the overall cluster is like, well, I talked to Kubelet. I sent the pod spec to Kubelet. It's Kubelet's job to talk to whomever or whatever that engine may be. So at this point, Kubelet has all of the resources that it needs, and it communicates to uh, Docker or Cryo or Containerd, whomever it is, says, okay, start that. I, here's your IP address. Uh, here's your other parameters. Start that container for me. So that's it. We now have our running replica. How our system does orchestration then is the back to the control plane, the cube controller manager has those operators. They never stop asking. They're always asking, what's the spec? What's the status? What's the spec? What's the status? So if your container were to fail, if your node were to fail, just go away on you. It, it, it just blips and somebody pulls the power cord. Well, they, those watch loops are, do I have something that matches these labels? And the deployment says, do I have a replica set? The replica says, yes, yep, still here. Okay, great. Replica set says, do I have a pod? Uh, no, you do not have a pod that has that label. Oh, well, spec doesn't match the status. I better start one. And the process continues. 
start a replica of this pod for me. Goes to this API server. API server asks the scheduler. Of course, if node number two is just gone now, the scheduler says, well, that's not a good choice. You're going to go to worker number three. And this process will continue times as many replicas as you want, as many different options as you want. So we can orchestrate and anything can go away. We can add new nodes. We can grow our cluster from one node to 5,000 nodes. We can scale our pods from one to 10. We can use the deployment, can deploy multiple replica sets for you and change from using the one version to the other. So you can do rolling updates and rollbacks. This kind of decoupled transient architecture that leverages ongoing operators or watch loops, always asking, always checking, means that we're expecting something to change and we operate around it. So that's why everybody really likes, well, one of many reasons to, to like or love Kubernetes, we are expecting it to have issues and it is built in not the most efficient way. There's probably more efficient ways to do it, but if only if you measure it at the small end. If you say I have hundreds of machines that are low cost, but my app is now running across them, and if anything happens, this operator will just start it again shortly and it'll be made available to you. We talked about how Kube Proxy and our network plugins are running everywhere. So it doesn't matter who you talk to, we'll get your traffic to your pod, wherever it may be, whether it's one replica or 500. And that's kind of a quick run through of the major components of the architecture. I mean, that was not a quick run through. That was a very detailed run through for the architecture and the components and how uh, how actually a person writes kubectl uh, run an image and a pod name. So it, it will, what steps it takes to deploy the complete, uh, to actually run that uh, small application or a microservice or a simple Nginx pod on the Kubernetes system. So I think that was a complete end to end, uh, you know, de detailed explanation of all the components which are there on the control plane, which is the CP and uh, uh, also on the uh, worker nodes where how the kubelet is working, how it uh, interacts with the uh, container runtime interface, a CSI, drivers if storage has the storage uh, has to be there so i think that's that's a pretty neat introduction to the architecture uh, by far the best one i have ever heard to be honest and uh, people do agree with me to uh, in in the chat so i'm not lying so people are agreeing that it is the best one uh, so by now, uh, those who are watching, who, you might now get the idea what Kubernetes is because uh, Tim has explained very uh, clearly like how the shift has happened and Kubernetes was there uh, internally uh, for a lot of time. And then the core was, um, you know, uh, exposed uh, to the uh, open source basically. And uh, then this is the architecture that you are seeing on the screen. Uh, pretty clear. All the components have their own, uh, you know, uh, own respective meaning and the purpose in the ecosystem and the controller manager the brain the api server all the communication happening the etcd cluster state and uh, your kubelet is responsible for running the pods interacting with the cryo and the cri proxies for your uh, you know uh, the networking ip table pooling and scheduler is for scheduling the nodes uh, right fit node for that particular workload so uh, i think that that pretty much is uh, covers the uh, introduction to Kubernetes and how uh, a pod uh, runs on Kubernetes because these are the basic building blocks like a pod, deployment, replica set, and these are the components, uh, the API server, controller manager, ETCD, scheduler, kubelet, kube proxy. So uh, with this, I think we are, um, uh, you know, we are now in a good state uh, to, uh, to start exploring. Basically, uh, if people want to, uh, you know, um, set up something, uh, set up a Kubernetes cluster, then probably how do they do that? Now this is, uh, you know, uh, like I said before, this is a search magic show, everything ties to the certification. Uh, so obviously uh, you, you have to have a cluster to practice. That is very important. Uh, so this will not only help you to uh, stand up a cl Kubernetes cluster, but also it can be helpful during the exam because you might have a question that where you're asked like, uh, you know, create a Kubernetes cluster uh, using KubeADM, then how would you do that? So uh, let's let's uh, do uh, the, the, the lab for uh, creating the cluster, Tim. Okay, sounds great. Uh, and, and in our courses, uh, we don't we don't write exam specific courses just just to kind of forewarn everybody. Instead, we try to make you the best admin possible, which of course also means that you'll be well well prepared for the exam. So it's not that we we don't ignore the exam, but a lot of times people expect a brain dump, like, well, just tell me what's on the exam, and that's not what we do. We want to give you the skills to go into a production environment and and get the job and do the job which is what certification is also about. So I always like to, to preface that when people say, well, is this exactly what I'll see on the exam? It's all the topics, all working with the tools that you will need, but it's not an exam specific thing. 
So the way our, our labs are written, I write them to be as flexible as possible. We use a two node cluster and that's to expose you to networking issues and evacuation from one node to another. You could run Kubernetes other ways. It's very flexible. There's 60 or seven conformant uh, software clusters out there. So you have options, but we try to expose you not just to this would work for the exam, but what am I gonna see when I get at the job? What is it that my cluster is gonna look like? So we use a two node cluster and we use KubeADM to build it. I've written the labs so that you could use VirtualBox, VMware, two spare laptops that are sitting around. Uh, you can use Google, Amazon, um, DigitalOcean, many options because it's just two instances. The only provider that tends to have headaches and, and we, we tend to just warn people just so you know is, is Azure. That have, they have their own some networking things that are kind of interesting there and they tend not to run, but it runs everywhere else with just two instances. So in this case, um, you would leverage, uh, this is Google Cloud. So I'm not using their Kubernetes, I'm just using two uh, instances. I'm this, not able to see, I'm only able to see the Kubernetes architecture screen. Thank you, thank you. I, I'm used to sharing my entire screen and not just the, yeah. uh, thank you for letting me know. So let's share that window real quick. Uh, yeah. And also very, screen. very, very good point said by Tim that uh, uh, even the search magic show or anything that is there, any training material that, that CNCF has produced is basically for making uh, you enable to do actual tasks uh, at your place, at your workplace. And in the last episode, I discussed exactly the same things, uh, like why certifications are important, because the learning journey will prepare you uh, for your jobs, at your work and everything. Absolutely. Are you seeing the, the Google screen yep. now? Okay, yep. great. So uh, I, I've just set up two nodes to be ready for the lab. Uh, one I called CP, the other one I call worker. Just so you know exactly what I did is I went to create instance. And I know this is going to be really slow now that I'm trying to do it uh, for everybody else. But the point is that you set up two instances. The big heavy lift that most people get stuck with is the networking side. So I'm just going to call this test. I'm going to choose a location to do it. I want to have two processors and eight gig of memory. It will run with less, but if you ever run out of resources, it's it kind of browns out and it gets confusing. So at least two processors, eight gig. We're gonna change it at the moment. We're still running Ubuntu 1804 because that's what the exam uses. The 2004 is gonna be coming soon. And as soon as the exam team updates, then Hopefully within a week, I'll get my stuff up and running and match whatever the exam environment is. So then the hard part that most people get stuck at is down here talking about networking. We don't want anything between our two nodes and in most environments, whether it's VirtualBox, that's not really that open. You actually have to turn it to promiscuous mode. It, with VMware, all of these key, KVM key move, whatever it is, make sure that your two nodes have nothing blocking traffic between them. Later, once you have it working, that's when you go back in and start adding firewall rules. But for now, let's make it completely open. So you go to networking and you can change it. In this case, I have a network that's called four class. And it, if you dig into what it is, there's nothing blocked. Everything is open, entirely open. So there's nothing between our nodes. That's usually the hard part of setting up your environment. VirtualBox, people don't realize that it still doesn't allow all traffic. KVM Kimu and your OVS switch, may not allow all traffic. So make sure nothing between your nodes. That's the hard part about this. And then you create it. And what you end up with is, uh, in this case, I have a node that will be my control plane and another node that will be my worker. Amazon has the same sort of thing. So here it's called a VPC. Amazon, it's, uh, I'm blanking on what they call it, but same concept. Make sure you go into the network tab and allow all traffic, not just this, not just that. Like, oh, I'm sure this is all I need, all traffic, Worry about it once you have it working to tighten it and lock it down. So when you end up with it, then you end up with um, a, a access to your notes. And let me uh, share that screen. So stop share, share, share screen, application window. Okay. So I have an application window here. I'm just using a, 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 a tool called the Terminator. Hopefully you're seeing two different terminals. This allows me to go back and forth. On the top, I have a my, I'm logged into my control plane on the bottom. I've logged into my worker. And so far I, I haven't done really anything at, at this point. So what I want to do at this point is to get my system installed and up to date. So I'm gonna go ahead and become root. Uh, and 
then I'm going to update and upgrade my environment just to make sure that I, it's current. So I'm going to focus on the control plane for the moment. So I'm going to zoom into that so you can just see that as, as it runs and as it goes by. So you're, uh, depend 1804 is, is getting a little old. So you might be asked some questions about, OK, during the update, uh, do you want to uh, allow a restart? Do you want to use the uh, local version? Uh, and you might be asked uh, time and date questions if you ever install Cryo instead. Uh, and so in this case, uh, Hopefully, it asks me these questions shortly. Uh, but as it as it's installing, where we're going with is we, we get the OS up to date. We add a repository to get to the software. Then we install the software and use the kubeadm init command. So that, um, that, in this case, didn't ask me any questions, but it might. So if it does, allow the reboot and then uh, keep the local version uh, of there. Now, in this case, you might want to, if you don't have an a, a, a editor, you might want to install one like Vim, Emacs, Nano, don't, don't really matter. Just make sure that you actually have that bit of information. Now, in this case, I could install Docker, app get install Docker IO. Or if you want, you could go and install uh, Cryo instead. Since Cryo is a little bit more complicated, why don't we try to do that here so you can see it? Uh, so either you would do an app get install Docker IO here, and then go, or here's 10 steps for getting your cryo to work. This is some of the things to get cryo to work. Uh, and container D is a little easier. So I actually chose the hard one because if you can get the hard one to work, the other one should be a little easier. So in this case, uh, mod probe of an overlay and a BR net filter. And then I want to make sure that this is also persistent. So I'm going to edit a sysctl file for keep uh, cries. We see uh, etsy sysctl.d 99 Kubernetes so it runs last. And inside of this, I'm going to make sure that the bridge, this is all about the networking, that IP forwarding is turned on, that um, my bridge interfaces are allowing it and paying attention to it. So here we see the, the three different parameters are saved to a file. Of course, I want to make sure I didn't mess that up. So sysctl dash dash system. And you should see at the bottom there that it's applying those changes among everything else uh, that you may have done. Now, uh, in this case, we now use the open SUSE uh, versions of software. So just to make life a little easier, I'm going to set. So I did an export of the operating system is X Ubuntu 18.04. Uh, and you know, and that will change depending on what version you're using. And then what version of Kubernetes or Cryo that you're planning on using. The Cryo gets updated in accordance, you know, a little bit behind when Kubernetes comes out, you get a version for that. So I'm going to use an echo command, and I'm going to create an apt sources list for the OpenSUSE repository. So Deb, this is what's going to go into your file. Deb, download OpenSUSE org, repositories, development, cubic, lib containers, stable, cryo, and then I passed it version in OS. You see what actually got put in there was 1.20 x Ubuntu 18.04. So for your versions, you can always go to download opensuzi.org and explore it. So if it changes and you can't find it, go there, and you should be able to find those resources as you look. Now, of course, we want to be able to actually use that software, so we can load the keys to it. And this is also, if you go to the cryo page, cryo.io, this is documented on that page. So if, if, if I'm talking too fast, you can't quite see the, the GUI. Cryo, the main page for Cryo, the Ubuntu install has all of this information in it. So I've added a repository this, to, this time. Um, oh no, I added the key. Now my second repository uh, for uh, the lib containers. Um, and uh, oh, let's say uh, issue with uh, backspace in my example. So I'm going to create a same thing, OpenSUSE repositories develop lib container stable for whatever my OS is. Uh, and it ends up being, of course, X Ubuntu 18.04. And I have a key for that repository as well. Okay. So just to, to show you as a history of what I've done so far, so you can kind of see it all together. Of course, there's, there's one typo in there. Uh, but otherwise, I've just uh, updated the system. And I've made sure that I can get to my cryo software as it gets, as it's available. Now that I've done that, I need to let apt know that there's a new version. 
And so it should be pulling. And I should see that it's successfully pulling from cryo and lib containers. That's a way of double checking you didn't typo like I did in the previous example. Okay. Then now that I got, it appears to have worked, let's install the packages. So we're going to install cryo and cryo run C. The run C version, there's a little bit of disconnects between the versions. So you could use the Ubuntu one, but it's not always perfect. So I want the cryo version of that uh, software. Then uh, it should be installed here pretty quick. Uh, and we want to make sure it actually is running. So I'm going to do a, a, a system CTL daemon reload. I'm going to just make sure that cryo is enabled and then start it and take a look at it. And uh, you know, hopefully, if my luck holds, it will say when I look at the status of it, it will say it is active and running. And you can look through to see if there's anything odd here. You get some, uh, you might see some errors with um, validating such and such. At this point, it's not a, a big problem. It's a warning of an error. So at this point, things are looking good uh, and and I can continue to the next step. So those steps I just did, so if I'm, let's look at my history again, uh, from step two to step 18 is to get cryo running. All of those steps could be replaced with app get install docker.io. Okay, so that, that just to kind of give you an understanding, if you chose the Docker route, you could replace that with Docker, or in this case, the harder, you know, more, not really harder, but more steps would be to get cryo running. Now we're back to both, no matter what your engine is, this is the process. We need to add the repository to get access to Kubernetes software now. So I'm going to add into a uh, another uh, sources list file that is a Debian package, and it has this parameters here. Uh, so apt Kubernetes IO, Xenial still, and then it's a little bit uh, behind there, and then main, and that's just the syntax for that repository. And we have another key that we want to make sure is, is in our environment. So we're going to curl and re re find this key here. Okay, curl from that uh, packages Google and pipe that to an apt add, add our key to our environment. It says, okay, that's good. And then we do another apt get update. So at this point, we should be able to get access to our Kubernetes software. And let's go ahead and install it. So if you, uh, you so app get install, now that the repositories work, and we want to install three different packages, kubeadm, kubelet, and kubecuddle. So the versioning of it depends on what you want to use. In this case, at the end of the package names, I've put a particular version. Uh, so if you leave that off, you'll get the newest version. So it's at the at the moment it's 1.21.2, unless dot three dropped. But that's just it. Updates happen. Major updates happen every three months. Minor updates happen every seven to ten days. So just be aware that there's uh, the one thing constant is change. So in this case, I like to know exactly what the version is, which matches the exam at the moment. So that's just something to be aware of. That since there's so much change, if you're not paying attention and you install a different version. There might be differences in the API. There might be subtle differences in commands. And then when you're in the exam environment, you're like, whoa, what's this? This isn't working the way I expected. So you always want to check. Go to, just to kind of to call it out here, go to cncf.io, certification, CKA, scroll down, and use curriculum overview and the handbook and verify the version. You'll also get that verification when you sign up for the exam. Make sure that whatever you're using matches what that is. Now, in this case, I might be using, let's say, 1.20 because I want to practice updating my kernel. So I'll, in, I'll install one version previous, and then I'll upgrade my kernel, and that way I get to practice that as well. And I'll see what a full upgrade of major version looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and, and hit Enter and install this software. Now, because it's, you know, I might be in an active environment and uh, other people are installing software and doing stuff, I don't want to accidentally get into a mismatch where I've initialized a, a kernel with a particular cluster with a particular version, and then I end up with something different a day later when somebody does an upgrade. So I'm going to go ahead and hold kubelet, kubedm, and kubectl. I know where it is. So somebody has to unhold that before they're able to, to update it. So if, you know, they're, who knows what they're updating? If it, it happens where somebody just runs the command and you get uh, a interesting uh, end result. So this way we're locked at this version until we go out of our way. 
now I would probably choose what is the network plugin that I want to use. And I'd start taking a look at it. I should know what my network plugin is before I initialize my kernel. You can change just about anything. It just might be very difficult to do that. So uh, what you would do then is, um, in this case, I'm getting from Project Calico. I chose Calico as a features. It's fairly straightforward to use. Uh, it is, uh, I think it's a good choice. Also, the exam environment has some options that use Calico. Uh, and we have a YAML file. Now, if we take a quick look at that, uh, get that uh, YAML file, we'll, we'll use this after our cluster is initialized. But one of the big problems people have when they set up their own lab environments is the IP ranges. So if we go through here, we see there's lots of settings. There's lots and lots of stuff in here. But let's go look for IPv4. Oh, oh, oh four. enter, next. Oh, there's a lot of them. Uh, okay, so we see that the default pool is 192.168. So if your VMs are like in the uh, virtual box, it's if you also chose 192.168, you're going to have lots of problems because routing won't work. So make sure that what I would suggest the easiest thing to do is change your VM network. Change it to something not 192.168. Okay? But the, so this is probably the most uh, common issue is that it doesn't. They don't understand what's happening, and so they chose an easy one, 192.168, and then there's contention and weird stuff happens. So easiest, I would say, is choose a different network range for your VMs. Okay, so networking is, is one of the big issues. But at this point, then uh, we would uh, find out what our our uh, primary name is. So my host name dash i, for example. This guy's IP address of my VM is a 10 dot. So it's a 10.128. There's no contention there uh, between them. And so now I can use it. If I eventually want to do high availability, I don't want my initialization script to be tied to the IP. Uh, so I'd like to use a name. It gives me a little more flexibility instead. So I'm going to take that. I'm going to add an alias to it. So I'm just going to copy this. And I'm going to edit my Etsy host file. And I'm going to in insert that. And we'll give it a very, very original name of Kate's CP, Kate's control panel, but whatever you want to call it. The advantage to this is if I bought, if I generate or initialize my cluster tied to Kate's CP, then if I use a uh, exterior firewall to multiple master, it the certificates will still line up. Uh, so that's just one of those like I'm looking forward things. Now there is a uh, config file that you can use in order to if you choose. Docker, it looks like one thing. If you're choosing cryo, you might need something else. Um, let's, uh, so I have one. Um, where? Uh, find uh, dollar sign home minus name cube adm dash config dot yaml. Okay. Oh, it's not my home directory. I'm root. I want the student, the non root. Okay. So let's do a cat of that file real quick. And we can see, so you guys can see what it looks like, that inside of this, kubeadm, cluster configuration, a particular version, Kate CP, that's the alias I used, port 6443. And then this pod subnet matches Calico. They match each other. So they'll be set up the same way. If you're using cryo, which is what we're using, then there is a, uh, there's a, a much bigger uh, configuration file. So let's do a find for that instead. And that's going to be called kubeadmcryo.yaml and cat of that file. And so and, and you, can, you can find this. You can search for a cryo config file. But what you end up with is all the settings cryo needs to know, like, what's my node registration? What's the name of it? Kate CP. Any other parameters, uh, certificate directories, IP ranges, version of Kubernetes, uh, DNS information, again, 192.168, and other parameters having to do with connectivity and TLS, cluster DNS, and settings. So potentially a lot. I, I use this just so you can see all of the things that you could use when you set up your particular 
uh, uh, cluster. So I'm going to go ahead and um, let's go ahead and just uh, copy that. So cp that file to the current directory. And so I have now the, the kubeadm, so cube, adm, init. And I tell it the config config to use is going to be the um, medium cryo, all those parameters. And again, you, you don't necessarily have to pass all of them, but I wanted you to see any one of these could change and might be necessary in your environment. Upload certs, just for to provide for later uh, use of other uh, masters. And I want to keep track of this output. So this is going to be a cp.out file for example, because there's a join statement in there that might go by and I might not see it. So if I didn't typo along the way, let's see if this works. Okay, so it says it's using the version I expected it, and it's doing some checks, and it's actually pulling down the images for those containers I mentioned during the architectural review, such as API server, scheduler, etcd, cube, uh, uh, cloud conf cube config manager. Uh, are all being pulled down, and then it's it's going to start them. And again, hopefully I didn't typo something in my uh, example to you guys. When you're doing stuff live, that always happens. You know, it's something goes sideways. But um, but so it's not, it so far. You know, this is usually where it, if I've typoed that file, this is usually where it has a problem because now it's trying to use these various containers. The 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 kubelet we talked about kubelet as a system CTL service. Kubelet is actually starting those containers for you. In this case, whew, got lucky this time. And, and lo and behold, it says, hey, it worked. It initialized successfully. To start using your cluster, you need to run this. So your, you don't know where it is. That cube cuddle command doesn't know where to go. You have to tell it. So you could give full admin capability. So I'm going to do an exit statement, but I'm going to copy and paste what they tell me to do. So copy this stuff over to your local directory so that you can actually use it. You can also do this export, which is calls it. But in this case, now it's persistent. And when I run a command, so cube ctl get node, it says that not ready, control plane. Remember how I said it uses some other names? That's We're shifting away from that to control plane. 42 seconds, so the containers are still starting. Stuff is still happening. And we see a join command. But it also tells us right here, hey, don't forget to start your network plugin. So if you had Weave, Cube Router, uh, Romana, uh, Flannel, there's options. We chose to use kubectl will be a create or apply. Let's go with what it tells me to do, fcalico.yaml. Oh, because I, uh, whoops, sudo cp, some rat roots directory I downloaded over there. Now I can do it. Uh, I forgot to move the file over, that's all. And create it, and it's now working. So the network plugin that allows me to talk to any worker and get where I'm going is now installed. kubectl get pod dash dash all dash namespaces. And some of them are pending, some of them are running. And now that I'm this far, let me go ahead and join so I'm, okay, I'm on my, my worker here. I'd want to run through all of those same steps that I did on the master. Now, we're getting close to time, so I don't necessarily want to go through it, but we'll go through the, the very same steps to get your system updated to, uh, let me show you where to stop, uh, Zoom terminal. So what you would do on your worker is you would do all of the same steps. So you, you would get your uh, cryo running, you would install it, you would make sure it's running, you would get the software and edit the Etsy host information. So uh, up to step 25 would be done on the worker. When you are, uh, but you know, you're not gonna initialize it, you just get it ready. And, in, and so when you're ready, you get the worker to that point, it's installed, cryo's running, the software is there, you've installed your, uh, the, um, you've installed your, kubeadm, kubelet, and kubectl uh, tools, then you use this join statement, which was at the, so kubeadm join, and it has a generated token and a hash, and that, that wor the uh, worker then will join uh, the master, and you'll have two nodes. You can keep joining workers. Be aware there's a time limit on that, so if you go tomorrow, you try to add a worker, you have to regenerate that. 
uh, those some of those tokens and ha and, uh, the hash actually stays the same, but the token changes its, I believe 24 hours is the default. But now that it's been a bit, let's see what happens. QCTL get node now, and it says ready. QCTL get pod dash dash all dash namespaces, and everybody's running. So this is a good place to be to join the worker. I think we're basically out of time, but um, how, how are we doing? What's what's the what's the plan at this point? Yeah, we can uh, join the worker. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we're going to join the worker. Okay. So just uh, just to 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 make my life a little easier, let's do it this way. And uh, I'll type history. And, and so again, let's join the worker. So uh, sudo dash i again and the roots history. So sudo dash i. And since since I have it here, what I can do is actually sort of like uh, this. I can do a overlay. Okay, so now uh, this is that CRI.conf information. So you guys can see some of these parameters here uh, a second uh, a second time. So let me go back and just make sure I'm using the right information. Okay, there it is. And so that's my um, CRI.conf information. Okay, and then the system version, the version uh, 1.20. I don't see OS listed there. That's interesting. That didn't get uh, saved in my my history for some reason. So let's let's go ahead and make sure we have that. So OS is set, version is set, and then let's start adding the stuff. So we added that. We add the key for it. There's my typo. So then we add the other lib containers, and. Um, it's interesting that the history isn't necessarily showing everything. So this is uh, always fun. So let's add the key for lib containers. Okay, that's there. And um, so we have the various bits of information. I've done two keys and let's test that I didn't typo something. App get update. And I see the cryo is listed and the lib containers is listed and it appears to actually be working. Uh, then install a cryo and run C. That looks to have worked. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe I spoke too soon. <sighs> I have no idea why it's going slow. It's just my luck, I guess. So basically, we're just catching up here. Come on. It knew that I was in a hurry is what's going on. So. Yeah. <laughs> No, but that that was really uh, interesting because um, cryo is by far the most uh, uh, would say would take more number of steps than the other ones out there, whether it's container D or whether it's Docker. So I think that was a very neat and very uh, you know a, a very good demo based on cryo. Uh, so basically, who ever are watching uh, you now have a complete installation steps uh, so you can actually set up you just need two compute nodes get them from anywhere just have two compute nodes and uh, you can you know then install uh, all the stuff that are required to set up kubernetes uh, starting from your uh, take it ubuntu one because that that again resonates with the exam so let go with the ubuntu uh, 18.04 for now and then you can install all the components kubeadm uh, and then cryo uh, then put the calico yaml file also have your um, uh, cube config uh, kubeadm config yaml file and hold your uh, kubeadm kubectl um, and kubelet um, uh, uh, so that it uh, you know, uh, it prevents the upgrades automatically. So uh, anybody who has to uh, update, they should unhold first and then do the upgrades. It is very important. And uh, yeah, then you do just a cube ADM in it, which is the magic command. And that will set up the cluster, give you some commands to run on the master. Then you have to set up the uh, networking because without that, now networking components, again, are separate from the cube ADM. So you can choose as per your choice. And then you will be having your uh, join token, which will be uh, your uh, token to uh, basically a full join command, not only the token. So a full join command that you can directly run uh, on the worker nodes. And 
on the worker nodes also till the cube adm uh, and the uh, you know uh, that that particular setup is required because you have to run the cube adm join command so you need uh, all those uh, things already set up on the worker nodes as well uh, and that's what tim is uh, tim has been doing uh, setting up that and putting on hold and now you'll be just running the uh, you know uh, the cube adm join command absolutely absolutely so to, so you can see what i've done on the, the worker node um, again the same thing where i just made sure that the cry interface for the network was set up. I set a, a version and a, an OS. I'm not sure why the second export is never showing up with my history, but um, making sure I get to the OpenSUSE repositories, one for the cryo, one for lib containers. Make sure that I install cryo and, and cryo run C from them, enable start it, add access to the Kubernetes software itself and the key, updated Etsy host, I installed the software, I forgot to do the update before, then I installed kubeadm, kubelet, kubectl of the same version, and I made sure to hold them as well. So now my worker is ready for that, that join command. Now, if I didn't see it go by, let's go find that again. So if I were to grab dash A4 for the word join out of my cp.out file, I would find it with what I need right there. So that's the join command. Let's Let's see if I did my worker correctly. So I said join, and it's trying to connect to the uh, control plane. It says, hey, I worked. Let's just see. kubectl get nodes. And I'm not the student. So kubectl get nodes. And it's there it is. It's worker. It's not ready yet, but it's on the way. So I'm going to zoom in for this. And kubectl get pods dash dash all dash namespaces. And we see that the Calico, that's the network plugin, is just getting loaded onto the worker node so that it can start communicating and handling the network. Uh, the other various, like core DNS and other stuff, is like proxy. Remember, we talked kubelet, qproxy, and so forth. That's running. And I'm guessing that just after a second here, I'm going to try again. Everybody's running. I have a cluster and cube CTL get node. They both show ready. Uh, great. Uh, questions? Anything coming my way from that? Awesome. Uh, yeah, there have been like a couple of questions, but uh, uh, we were going with a you know uh, with a full flow, uh, so sure. didn't want to break that. And uh, amazing, like like I said before, the best architecture architecture explanation, and now this was the best uh, demo for Kubernetes setup as well. So, uh, and I think uh, people are agreeing to that. So, uh, people have loved the. Uh, the demo uh, and we have a comment like this is how the demo should be so uh, that's that's really good uh, so a couple of questions are there but I think uh, we can take that like uh, do we need to know the knowledge of flannel and all those tools I can read a couple more um, yeah if you if you go into um, which you may have already done so uh, let, let me uh, share the screen if for the exam topics if you look it says you have to have some basic knowledge of uh, the networking. So, of course, what does basic mean? Uh, the idea being is that you should be able to, to to kind of point at what you need and say, do I want flannel? So, can I identify the differences between them? So, are you seeing my browser now? Yep, now we can. Okay, awesome. So, if I go into the curriculum overview uh, and find the CKA curriculum PDF, it gets generated here and I scroll down. And these are all the bullet points. You probably went through this before. Uh, you've already made, let me just hit some points again. Uh, take all, every single bullet point here, put it into a word processor underneath, write the commands to do it. Anywhere you see the word understand, that's not what you think understand is. Understand means create, integrate, troubleshoot, delete, repair. So anywhere you see the word understand, it's much bigger than you can recognize that that is. On a browser test, right? So you know, they, meant, they don't actually particular um, cluster. If you go into the uh, candidate handbook, which I suggest you read, that's one of the two documents I suggest you read, it does mention if you look at the clusters, you have several clusters available to you. Uh, one or two of them are running Calico. The other ones are running Flannel. Flannel runs everywhere, but doesn't have a lot of features. So it, it's um, I can't answer specific questions about what you need to know, but you'll notice in this list, Calico isn't called out particularly, Flannel isn't called out particularly, but connectivity, host network configuration. Uh, your name and the
that I can send you the 50% off uh, certification vouchers. Uh, so please, if you are watching the stream anytime later as well, uh, make sure you send me uh, the uh, send me your name, and that, that would be uh, uh, you know uh, that would be awesome. And yeah, thank you, Tim, for your time. And it was a super awesome stream, to be honest. And people who will be watching later would love this. Uh, this will be uh, up on Twitch and will be later uploaded to CNCF uh, uh, Cloud Native TV playlist as well. And uh, really excited, uh, uh, really uh, happy that we uh, did this particular show. And um, uh, yeah, follow the Cloud Native TV button because there are awesome shows that are lined up complete week and people do uh, day after day. Uh, so make sure you do that. and. Uh, uh, this is a bi-weekly show on Thursdays, 8.30 p.m. And uh, we'll try to get uh, Tim again uh, for some time, uh, let's see, on his schedule. And uh, or some other folks, or it will be by myself alone. And we'll be, uh, you know, continuing some of the learnings and some of the cool demos like we did today. So uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, anything you would like to say? No, thanks very much. I encourage everybody to, to practice this stuff. And again, get your YAML, keep practicing. Remember, you only have two hours. So practice with a two-hour mindset. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, take care. Bye. Bye.